front, see how it works. Thank you, sir. The is yours. Uh, my name is uh, Fletcher. I'm a barrister and solicitor of the High Court of New Zealand and I've held a practising certificate for 25 years. I hold accreditations as a youth and mental health advocate and I'm on the litigation committee for the Canterbury District Law Society. I have appeared in courts all over the country, up to and including the Supreme Court. I've held a firearms licence since I was 16. I'm a Mountain Safety Council firearms instructor and range officer. I've represented New Zealand at the United Nations Arms Trade Treaty in Geneva and Switzerland on two occasions. I'm a commissioned officer in the New Zealand Army. I currently hold the rank of Major and I've served New Zealand operationally in both Afghanistan and East Timor. I'm a credited prosecutor and defence counsel for the Court Martial of New Zealand. I'm very familiar with firearms, law and the research in relation to gun control and I wish to record my opposition to the bill in its entirety. In my view, having read the bill, it will not make the community any safer in any measurable way. It unfairly penalises the law abiding and on any cost benefit analysis creates a considerable cost for no return. I completely endorse what the Law Society has said in that it unfairly strips rights guaranteed to New Zealanders from mem members of the community and their families virtually, sorry, by virtue of their hobbies and interests. It is wrong, it is profoundly wrong to amend the Arms Act until the Royal Commission is, has finalised its work, as this committee cannot know the gaps it is intending to patch. I wonder, Mr Fletcher, knowing your advocacy skills through the week, we'll go to questions. Sure. Because I think we get more value out of it. Okay. Um, there's, there's one point I wish to enlarge on. In my view, it is critical that the committee looks at removing control of the Arms Act from the New Zealand Police. If you talk to any member of the Defence Bar or the legal profession in Christchurch, including QCs, every single one of them will say the police are out of control. You sit at council's table in the district court and every defence lawyer will hear tales of swatting. <coughs> that is to say, the armed defender squad turning up to your house on the thinnest legal pretext and seizing firearms. The search and surveillance bill has been broken by the police in this country and I'm advising that there will be matters that will play out in the High Court and the IPCA as a result of that. Point on, point on that. Um, firstly, who, who other than the police do you think should... And before you administer yep. the policy in the hours, but the second point you said particularly swatting. Uh, swatting is a, swatting is a, an American term. But enforcement would have to remain. In place. Oh, I'm absolutely. Not, I'm not sure we can address that particular yes. issue. But yes. who, who other than the police? Should well, this needs to be a dedicated agency. When I look at the agencies that administer certain dangerous uh, items in common play, civil aviation, for example, is a good point. Land transport um, is another example of that. There are other agencies that have specialist advisors with specialist skills in specialist areas. So civil aviation staff are familiar with how control towers work. There is no reason why there can't be an, an agency, whether it's tacked on to, for example, internal affairs or another agency that administers firearm, the licensing and all that sort of thing. The advantage for that, I think, is in terms of costs without any shadow of a doubt because it will reduce friction in the interface between the public and the agency. Yet the compliance still remains with the, with the police, obviously. Thank you. I was, I was going to touch on two points. One, I note you make the same point in your submission about the uh, negative effects of the mental health um, yes. connection and that it's going to deter people from seeking help in their stay. Without any doubt. Yeah. The second point I wanted to ask you about, uh, being that you're a fellow lawyer, is the definition of a gun club that has to get licensed. I'm very concerned, as I read it, and I want your view, that it effectively says that any land that any member of the public shoots on is a gun club and therefore has to be licensed. That to me seems to be entirely unworkable. I, I think I can um, say that there are, there are aspects of the bill, and this is one of them, I've been asked to give my legal advice, and I, I can say modestly I know a thing or two about statutory interpretation. And a lot of the questions I've been asked, I say, I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 I genuinely feel that the best lawyers in this country, myself included, <laughs> could, could not, I think, fairly and reasonably advise their clients yeah. in relation to certain aspects of thought. I 
cannot decide what the uh, the classic example is whether a part is belongs to a restricted firearm or not. At one extreme of the spectrum, you'd have to have a bolt from a Sarko bolt action rifle. That's clearly not a restricted part. On the other hand, you'd have a bolt from a Kalashnikov pattern rifle. That's clearly a restricted part. But there are pieces that, that are exactly in the middle. I could not tell a client whether legally they can hold certain items or not, and I'd be frightened to because if I get this one wrong, they're going to have the armed defender squad turning up. Yeah. So, um, with the committee's indulgence, going a long time. Um, I'm, I'm interested in your um, Bill of Rights issues. So, I, I just want to, you know, I, I, we all recognise how important those questions are. Um, could you just touch on what you see as the really key issues there? As far as the Bill of Rights issues yeah. go, it seems to me that people have the right to be you know, secure in their homes. Now, I'm not willing to go into the committee in relation to certain events that have occurred um, right. as a result of this, but I am able to say that people have had their families, as well as themselves, detained by the New Zealand police as a result of a perception and also the seizure of E-category firearms in, this Christchurch, in, in Christchurch. The, the right to have your home protected from government so, overreach is breached by this act. So right of entry? Right of entry. And also... Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, also right against unreasonable detention because if the, if, if the 5 turn up at your house and say we want to have a look at your guns, you're not able to leave. And if you're a collector and you've say got 20, 30, 40 firearms, you will be detained by the police for literally hours. As will be your family, because they won't be able to leave the house. Did you look at the owner's questions in respect to offences? Owner's of proof? Yeah. Yes, but I'll, I'll, I mean... Okay. No, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of these legislation. Yeah. Along that point, Dr. Webb, so others have raised the a right to silence aspect. Have you looked at that also? Yes, I have. Um, the, the right to silence is breached, as you know, by certain other pieces of legislation, and the ones that spring to mind are the Fisheries Act and the Biosecurity Act. There is a thin argument to say that those are quite specialist pieces of legislation, but both the Fisheries Act is because of the unusual nature of fisheries law and the Biosecurity Act is the questions you have to answer from a biosecurity perspective could be critical, i.e. where did the foot and mouth covered boots come from? And also in terms of the Defence Act, you lose your right of silence if you're talking to a military court of inquiry. I do not consider that there is anything in the Arms Act that is so pressing that would override the right of silence. It, it, it is, um, and you know, practically, as a as a lawyer, if a person relies on 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 their right of silence, that means that they have to get in the witness box if they've got an excuse. So, if you choose to exercise your right of silence and you're charged and you wish to defend those charges, then unless you've got another excuse, you will have to give evidence in court under oath. So, I just don't see why the bre why the right of silence should be breached and and effectively uh, an administrative function. Better call it. Yes, thank you, sir. One. Yes. <laughs> right. You made the point about the ten-year um, disqualifications. Yeah. Um, um, would would if there, if some of us might have a view that some offences warrant a long stand-down period, if you like? Yeah. Would that be more palatable if there were at least a means to appeal? Without any doubt, and, and very briefly, the thing that's more concerning about that is um, having appeared in the family court in my profession. A, you're going to get the armed defender squad being turned up, turn up, turning up, and B you're going to be unable to get a firearms licence for 10 years for literally doing the right thing. Mm. Right. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Uh, John Wilson. Morning. 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 I have some...